Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Pola Olegzarek's novel, Mona, translated from the Spanish by Adam Morris, and published by FSG just last year in 2021. Oleg Zarek is an Argentinian, Argentine? Argentinian uh, writer, academic. I believe she's doing or has already done a PhD at Stanford University, something that she actually shares with her main character. And this book is really just a lot of fun, and it explores a lot of ideas that are very near and dear to my heart, as it's interested in a lot of the same kind of circles that I run in. What this book is, in many ways, is a satire or just a blatant critique of the literary elite, of the academic literary world, and of the publishing world, the world of international book prizes and the publishing industry. These two worlds are, in many ways, fundamentally built upon the same things, the same ideologies, the same biases, the same problems. But this book also explores interpersonal relationships and abuse and trauma. And so these two worlds, that of the academy, the, the university and the international publishing scene, and this interpersonal relationship that is filled with abuse and trauma, these two worlds really blend together in this novel in very, very compelling ways. At the beginning of this book, we're introduced to Mona, who is from Peru, but she's also a young graduate student at uh, Stanford University, where she's doing a PhD in an English department, but she's also just been invited to Stockholm to attend this literary conference because she was just nominated for this very, very prestigious literary award. So most of this book takes place at this literary academic conference in Sweden, where she meets up with all of these different authors and poets and artists from all around the world. And there's some interesting critiques uh, through each of these secondary characters, as each of these characters sort of embody the perception of the country that they're from. We get characters like the Icelandic poet, the Macedonian author, the Japanese writer, the Azerbaijani German writer. And Oleg Zarek uses each of these as a kind of stand-in for the perception that people have of people from these countries. And at times, this actually borders on stereotype. And this actually leads to one of the problems with this book, which is something that I don't know exactly how to solve, but the main character is incredibly unlikable. And that's not a critique in and of itself. I rarely read books in which I like the main character. It's an insane thing when people say that they didn't like a book because the main character was unlikable or not relatable. But the problem with it in this book is that there is this disconnect between what this book is trying to do, which is to criticize the literary elite in all these various uh, forms, and the way that it goes about doing it. See, Mona also stereotypes everyone around her. She's fat phobic. She's cruel a lot of the time. That is, it's unclear at times if these characters are written like stereotypes or if Mona is only perceiving them as stereotypes, as she's unable to see them as individuals or something like that. I mean, each of these characters have names, but Mona often just refers to them as the Icelandic poet and so on. And so a lot of this is funny. I mean, most of this, I think, is being played for laughs. And there's a wry humor throughout this entire book as it satirizes and parodies the, the literary world. But it's also, at times, doing the very thing that it's critiquing. And, and I could be wrong here, but it's unclear to me whether the book is self-conscious that is doing that. This is all to say that this book critiques a manipulative, narcissistic, self-congratulatory industry from the perspective of a character who is, well, all of those things as well. So like I said, most of this book takes place on a seaside resort outside of Stockholm, but the opening of this book begins in the United States. And so there are a lot of American-centric ideas and institutions that are kind of at the core of this book, at the core of the critique of this book. Most importantly, or at least most interestingly for me, uh, is how she critiques the American university. And really what Oleg Zarek is trying to expose here is how these institutions engage with a kind of racism and sexism that is shrouded in liberalism or neoliberalism, but how the university really isn't as progressive as it claims to be, especially with issues relating to gender and race. And in fact, it's actually quite bad. And as someone who has spent the better part of the last decade in higher education and has sat through way too many problematic diversity workshops and who receives dozens of emails every single month about how these 
ultra-rich board of trustees of my university are fighting systemic racism by, I don't know, changing the name of a building or something like that. As someone who is currently in that world, I found this part of the book to be especially pertinent. And I need to be really clear here. I am wholly in favor of diversity workshops. I am wholly in favor of fighting systemic racism and all these different issues. These things are incredibly important to me, politically, ethically, as a student, as a teacher. The problem is, is how corporatized this movement has become in neoliberal universities. As these universities with multi-billion dollar endowments will pay tens of thousands of dollars to bring in a corporate company to run a workshop with the administrators or something like that. That is, they don't seem that worried about actually fixing the systemic problems, but just slapping a very expensive Band-Aid onto the problem and then showing off how pretty the Band-Aid is. I mean, let's just see how Harvard reacts to this latest scandal they're embroiled in right now. This is all to say that when it comes to making real, actual changes, universities, especially the deans, the board of trustees, the presidents, that ilk, they seem rather uninterested in change. Anyways, I need to make that clear because this isn't a reactionary response to liberalism, but a leftist response to a neoliberal bastardization of an otherwise really good thing. And obviously I can't speak to Pola Olegzarek's politics, nor do I want to, but she seems to be coming at it from a similar angle. In fact, this book opens with Mona contemplating her time at Stanford University and how her Peruvian identity has been exploited by the university. Mona had arrived at Stanford not long after the waves she had made with her debut novel tossed her onto the beach of a certain impestuous prestige. And at times, when being a woman of color in the vade macum of American racism began to confer a cheek sort of cultural capital, American universities shared certain essential values with historic zoos, where diversity was a mark of attraction and distinction. By, placing, by playing the part of an overeducated Latina adrift in Trump's America, Mona experienced academic captivity as a sort of serene freedom. She goes on to talk about how when the American universities ask her for her ethnicity, she not only ticks the Hispanic box, but underneath writes Inca as well, because she knows that that will lend her more credibility in the university. She knows that these identity markers are important, not for her, of course, but for the bureaucratic university who likes to claim diversity. So them being able to tick off that they have a Hispanic woman and an indigenous woman, well, it's a win-win. And so Mona has this identitarian fantasy, uh, and she goes on to explain that Mona's identitarian fantasy was quite well received on campus, it related to her research topic, and offered her the opportunity to advance her career merely by being herself, as, as much herself as humanly possible. Later she realized it would have been even more adva advantageous to add on some kind of physical disability, a slight but evident defect, but nobody's perfect. So you can see how Mona is pretty unlikable. But the point remains, her identity as a woman of color, as a Hispanic Inca, didn't matter to her at all before she came to the United States. But now, it's all that matters. It better be her entire identity, at least from the perspective of the university. For them, everything about Mona is reduced down to her gender and her race. And just a few pages later, while she's, for, some, for whatever reason, thinking about what the university would do if they stumbled across her dead body, how they would identify her. And she calls herself her body a non-white, Hispanic, Inca, Latina of color. I mean, the only thing she's really missing here is to use the term Latinx rather than Latina to, uh, if she really wants to fit in with that sort of neoliberal identity politics. And so this book is really interested in the performance of identities, especially of racial and gender identities, as the university forces them to perform them. And so the beginning of this book is really interested in that. But then we quickly get on a plane and we move to Sweden. And really interestingly, while on the flight and while at the conference in Sweden, Mona is constantly getting updates about this case back in Peru where this young woman has gone missing. And I won't say too, too much about this because I don't want to spoil it, but it's pretty clear from very, very early on that something bad has happened to this young woman. And so in the background of this novel is this violent misogyny. And actually throughout the beginning parts of this book, we keep getting these, these, these text messages and we, we're not sure where they're coming from, but the texts don't seem great, right? They read like 
you can't just run off like that. I'm coming over. You can't escape. We need to talk. So we quickly realize that these are coming from men you know, that she's been in relationships in the past who are and continue to be quite abusive towards her. And she actually has this recurring thought while at the conference, um, how long do bruises last? As she's trying to hide the bruises on her body, but of course there's also the, the metaphor of, of trauma being bruises. So these two things, this very personal, very intimate trauma, and then this much larger cultural trauma while she's following this case of, of, this, of this missing young woman back in, back in Peru, these two things are always in the back of Mona's mind throughout this book. It haunts Mona. There's always this deep trauma just lurking in the back of her mind, and it informs almost everything else in this novel. It informs how Mona acts towards other people. And so you can probably see what's going on in this book. We have this young woman who is navigating the literary elite world while also navigating these very personal and then much larger cultural traumas that are constantly haunting her. Both the literary world and these abusive relationships are structures of power that fundamentally operate on the same presuppositions, that of a deep structural misogyny. And what's interesting here, of course, is that she places some of the most pervasive uh, misogyny in the university, in these liberal institutions, a space that likes to think that it's beyond these problems, but of course it's not, especially at the institutional level. These problems persist, and they will continue to persist if nothing fundamentally changes. And so I won't say too much here, because this book is actually a lot of fun to read, and I really don't want to spoil the experience. It's also incredibly funny. Um, at, at least I found it very funny as an academic. Actually, there's just one part that I wanted to note, because she makes fun of the idea of networking that is so popular um, in universities, but also in, in a very kind of American corporate way that universities have really picked up on. Um, and, and she writes, she spent the time wrapped in a haze thick enough to get through classes and department events meant to facilitate networking, a word Americans use to describe socializing with colleagues as though they needed a concept to justify, it, uh, to, to justify kindness and camaraderie at work. As, as someone who is very strongly encouraged to attend conferences and all sorts of these different things, uh, that's just hilarious to me. <laughs> And Mona turns into something very different by the end. It becomes quite absurd in a lot of ways, and in some ways that I actually really liked, and I actually kind of wish that more of this book had this very absurdist, over-the-top uh, feel to it. I'll try to be vague here, but if you don't want to hear at all how this book ends, and skip to here, but I need to talk about it in some way. The ending is an absurd tsunami. The world erupts on a mythic scale like Ragnarok just came to be. As this seemingly inconsequential small gathering at this conference is magnified to this mythological scope. And there's something to this that I find quite interesting. This seemingly insignificant literary event being blown out of proportion as the problems that this book explores keep happening again and again and again, as scandal after scandal wreak havoc on heretofore untouchable institutions. And people begin to lose more and more faith, rightly or wrongly, in these institutions as these scandals take over public consciousness. I mean, look what happened to the Nobel Prize in 2018, or look at what's happening to Harvard right now. Both of these institutions are rightly being criticized and deconstructed as their abusive structures are finally coming to light in social consciousness. What happens from here, though, we don't really know. And what happens at the end of this book is rather unclear. After destruction, there always has to be rebirth. I mean, go read the Old Norse poem Vuluspau to find out what happens after Ragnarok. And I'm not just making that connection because I love Vuluspau, but it's referenced quite a few times at the end of this book, directly and indirectly. It's unclear if these institutions will learn from these problems and adapt and grow, or if they will dig their heels in and continue to resist change until they're ultimately destroyed. Mona raises a lot of interesting questions, and they're questions that I think all of us in the various sects of the literary world need to consider. And we need to confront as we're entering book prize season, as we're all going to start getting excited about the Booker Prize and all of these different prizes, and we continue to place so much trust in publishers to tell us what to read. I mean, this book was published by FSG, not quite an independent press, but anyways. 
I think this book is really worth reading. I think it brings up a lot of really important questions and it poses very well thought out critiques of these systems that I think is really necessary to consider. But for now, thanks for watching.